Okay. So good evening, everyone. Today, uh, we have this great opportunity uh, to interact with Ambassador Hardy on his latest book, Amer America's Two Cold Wars from Hegemony to Decline. It's an absolute honor to have you, sir. Let me introduce Ambassador Hardy to our listeners. He is a retired Venezuelan diplomat, a scholar, and an author. He has received his PhD from the Geneva School of Diplomacy and International Relations and has several master's and postgraduate degrees. Before resigning from the foreign services, he was one of his country's most senior career diplomats, having served as ambassadors to the United States, the United Kingdom, Spain, Brazil, Singapore, Chile, and Ireland. And this book has been timed. It is, is a uh, you know very well. We see the geopolitics today changing. The way uh, things have changed, especially after the Russian uh, attack on Ukraine. But this this book especially focuses on a tussle between two uh, you know powers, uh, the U.S. and China. And I'll now invite Ambassador Hardy to briefly, uh, you know, sum up his book so that we can, you know, uh, listen to the author himself and also, um, you know, then take on a few questions regarding the book. Over to you, Ambassador Hardy. Thank you very much. Very honored to be invited again by SNS Foundation. A couple of years ago, I gave a talk to SNS Foundation in relation to my previous book, which was called America's to a which was called the uh, China versus the U.S. who will prevail. In that book, I talked about the emerging Cold War within uh, these two superpowers. Uh, I felt that uh, I had to uh, keep uh, exploring uh, about this subject, and then and then hence I decided to write this new book which, as you said, it's called America's to Cold War from a Germany to decline, which essentially deals with a comparison between the Cold War that for 40 plus years the U.S. waged with the Soviet Union with its current emerging Cold War with uh, China. And hence, in the book, I pose two big questions, the first one being uh, what is the difference as a strategic, which is the difference as a strategic competitors between the former Soviet Union and current China? And secondly, which is the difference between the United States of today and its former self when it confronted the Soviets? And from the norm, I try to answer these two questions through five uh, propositions. The first proposition being from hegemony, uh, is, is from from uh, uh, ideology to efficiency, uh, uh, and and what I mentioned there is that although multifaceted, the Cold War between uh, the U.S. and uh, the Soviet Union had ideology at its core on the pining element which suited uh, very well the U.S., having been the founding, having been the birthplace of liberal democracy and its most devoted preacher, uh, it was easy for it to reclaim the mantle of leader of the free world. Uh, and hence, um, it, it carried very well this role. Uh, on the other side of the fence, the Soviet Union also embodied... Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Can you please move a little towards your laptop or your computer? Uh, your voice is a little low. Yes. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Yes. Is it better now? Okay. Uh, so, um, currently, uh, um, this ideological contest was not only clear cut, but uh, clearly beneficial to the United States because freedom, notwithstanding that the contradiction that the notion of the free world may entail, uh, was indeed an arrow directed uh, to the Achilles heel of a totalitarian system as the Soviet system was. 
the emergent Cold War is not based in ideology. Um, to begin with, America's liberal narrative has lost credibility as it's been seriously contested home itself. But on the other hand, uh, all that matters for China since the times of Deng Xiaoping is that the cat catches mice, meaning uh, that it provides results that it delivers. Hence, uh, not only America liberal order, it's uh, contested, but uh, uh, what matters for the Chinese is providing results. Efficiency does becomes the defining element of this new Cold War. And contrary to the comparative advantage that the US had during its first Cold War, uh, the US is, past, is badly prepared for a competition frame in efficiency terms. Um, and, and indeed, America has fallen in many areas in relation to other countries of, uh, of other developed countries, as many problems have been left unbridled for a long time. Two examples may be infrastructure or education, but there are many more. Uh, China, on the other hand, has shown the most impressive historical record in providing results. In 40 years, it has uh, done an amazing job in uh, presenting itself as from, the, from being a, 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 a poor country to be in the, in the antechamber of economic hegemony. Uh, secondly, the second proposition I, I mentioned in the book is from hegemony to the squandering of alliances. In the final phase of World War II, or subsequently, the US was able to build a series of multilateral institutions, organizations, initiatives, and alliances, uh, that, and uh, all of them supported its international legitimacy. On the other side of the fence, of, of course, we found the Soviet Union with its own uh, system of alliance and institution, which was a much smaller one, and confronting, or, or in any case, challenging the both of them, we had, we found the non-aligned countries where India plays such an important role. Um, but the fact remained that the US was at the top of the game. Uh, its system of alliance was the most formidable that uh, had ever existed. And with the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the whole world had to acquiesce under this American hegemonic system. Um, um, nowadays, what we found is different. Um, since uh, George W. Bush uh, time, America's role unilaterally eroded substantially its international standing. And um, that generated an important uh, lack of trust in America by its um, traditional allies. Uh, even though uh, Obama tried to reconstruct uh, this trust in America, uh, he didn't have enough time, and uh, Donald Trump's arrival to power ended up by eroding this trust in America as a result of his dog eat dog policy, in which the top dog America had uh, to take advantage of uh, it, it, its uh, superior position in the international arena. So, uh, the U.S. has squandered substantially its, uh, its, its uh, position vis-à-vis -vis its allies. Of course, my book didn't anticipate the invasion of Ukraine by Russia and all that it entailed, the reconstitution uh, of, of OTAN, of, uh, of NATO, sorry, uh, which, according to President Macron, was brain dead in times of Trump, and which has come back to life with great strength at this point in time. But of course, 
this may end up being circumstantial, as in two years' time, three years' time, America may be inaugurated again a new Trump administration. And uh, we don't know what may, what may happen if there is a long Ukraine war. But in any case, what is clear is uh, that on the other side of the fence, uh, an important block in the making has taken place between China and Russia. And this is a coalition this, uh, that the United States should have never allowed. The United States should have never allowed those, those two countries to coalesce in the way they did. Of course, at the beginning of the century, that wasn't clear at all, but, it's, but since 2008 forward, uh, the trend was clear enough, meaning China became uh, assertive enough in its foreign policy, and conversely, uh, Russia made clear enough since its invasion of Ukraine that it wouldn't admit further in Western encroachment into its board. So it was a time probably from America to begin building bridges with the lesser of the two competitors instead of having to face the two of them at this point in time, which will mean a huge distraction in the best case scenario, but which in the worst case scenario may entail that the, these two countries uh, coordinate their action in order to overwhelm America's response capabilities. Um, um, simultaneously, in addition to its coalition with, uh, in the building with, uh, with uh, Russia, China has undertaken a multilateral institutional building process that recalls the one undertaken by the US in the final months and subsequent years of World War II, uh, in, in the final stage and subsequent years of World War II. And in that case, aims had given shape to a favorable international architecture. One, in this case, essentially uh, oriented towards the economic sphere. This not only neutralizes to a significant extent uh, China's nationalistic excesses, but allows it to acquire a huge array of its stakeholders in its future. The third proposition I wanted to outline was from a strategic consistency to zigzagging. The 20 years that succeeded World War II were the golden age of America's foreign policy. It was a highly rational period where consistency prevailed. Um, um, and at the center of this system was a fundamental guidance strategy, the containment of the Soviet Union expansionist impulse. From 1965 onwards, as a result of the Vietnam crisis, uh, the, the, the American foreign policy was uh, tremendously shaken, but nonetheless, it remained in place. It remained, uh, it has, it was consistent enough to keep challenging, keep facing the Soviet Union in a consistent manner. Um, and that proved to be fundamental in relation to its final success. Currently, America's foreign policy consistent is totally unexisting. And, and the reason derives from its domestic problems. In the past, America was vertically split by its multiple divides, and this was coherent with its uh, with its the system constructed from its founding fathers. Nowadays, however, parties and identities have merged with those multiple divides. You have multiple divides, um, from abortion to gun ownership to whatever you may think about. And these multiple divides uh, <clears throat> have merged with the two big political parties, generating two overwhelming majorities that coexist side by side, uh, demonizing each other. An overwhelming of a horizontal fracture has taken place in the US. And of course, 
it's very difficult to have any kind of, co of, of consistent foreign policy when its two main uh, political parties exist in two different planets. Uh, China stands in a completely different ground in this uh, relation. Beijing has a clear national project and a well-rounded foreign policy that, aim, uh, that aims at providing support to the materialization of that uh, of the national projects. Even, uh, even more, its geopolitical ambitions are more localized, interconnected, and in more cases, close, closer to home. More broadly put, the U.S. aims at becoming the number one global power by 2049, the years in which it uh, reaches the centenary of the People's Republic. And in addition, on top of that, we found the fact that uh, Xi Jinping's leadership, although has become tremendously autocratic, uh, derailing a well-established succession model in China, had at least provided some benefits for the continuity and the consistency of its foreign policy. It has provided uh, greater unity to the party. It has provided civilian uh, control over the military, and it had it has reconnected the, the party with uh, the population of the country. The third um, proposition I wanted to make is the from economic high ground to economic low land. At the end of the 1970s, the Soviet Union was sustaining a defense budget that was equivalent to that of the US, but from a GDP base that was but a fraction of America's. Uh, moreover, while the U.S. economy was a highly diversified one, the Soviet one was dependent in, in oil exports, meaning uh, was contingent on in, an inherently volatile raw material. As if that was not enough, the U.S. was a, a, so... Um, the, the U.S. Uh, sorry, the Soviet Union uh, problems multiply upon Ronald Reagan's arrival to power. He not only sustained Carter's, uh, Jimmy Carter's decision to put an end to the tent, but went much further, rolling back communist small around the world, attempting to make nuclear arm missiles, missiles obsolete, uh, to its defense, a strategic defense initiative, um, and, and pursuing reaching change in Moscow itself. Uh, countering an offensive, an offensive of this nature would have required, would have required an economic strength that uh, Moscow clearly did not possess. Uh, simply put, uh, the, the Soviet Union was pushed to the ropes by bankrupting its economy. China, it's in a different category altogether. It accounts for 25% of the global industrial output and contributes with around one third of the world's economic growth. Moreover, in a few years' time, it will surpass America's GDP in absolute terms where yet, since 2014, it already saw passage in power purchasing, in purchasing power parity. Uh, hence, China's possibility of outspending the U.S. military budgets at will will keep increasing uh, um, with every passing years uh, after it attains economic uh, supremacy. However, without attaining economic supremacy and still spending much less than the U.S. in defense, the U.S. Uh, China has already developed the capability to maintain American larger defense projects at, at, at bay. This is attained by several ways. First, by developing 
by maintaining technological wage in asymmetric weapons, uh, by developing a retaliatory nuclear strike, a strike capability within a minimum deterring nuclear strategy, although this seems to be changing, and essentially by concentrated the bulk of its armed forces close to home within an area denial strategy where America diffuses its armed forces all around the world. Uh, the, um, the, the full proposition is from recent world containment um, to unattainable containment. The, the United States emerged from Second World War as the most richest and powerful country. Nonetheless, it was also a very insecure country because it had taken conscience that it could not isolate itself anymore, that it was interrelated to the rest of the world and that its security depended more to what happened outside its borders than what would happen inside its borders. Hence, uh, Russia, uh, the Soviet Union expansionist moved represented by this military machine, this juggernaut, uh, this Soviet juggernaut in Stalin's hand, worried the US substantially. However, um, and, 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 and in order to respond to this uh, perceived threat, the US frame its uh, um, containment strategy to Soviet expansionism, a patient, systematic, and long-term strategy. Um, fortunately for the US, and fortunately for the world, uh, Stalin understood that no new games were possible in Europe beyond the Iron Curtain, uh, and hence it moved uh, and hence both Soviet expansionism and American containment moved into the so-called Third War. Uh, frictions between the two superpowers were hence removed uh, from the most geopolitical combustible uh, area of the world, which substantially reduced the risk of a direct confrontation between them, with the notable exceptions of uh, Berlin in 1960 and uh, Cuba in 1962, uh, both countries avoided geostrategic charge scenarios. <clears throat> in the end, containment proved to be extraordinarily successful, attaining the, the goal that it had uh, posted. And having attained that kind of success, nothing seems more natural for the Americans than trying to replicate containment in relation to China as well. But the case is very different in relation to China. And um, indeed, uh, although not framing it as a containment policy, uh, Obama, Trump, and Biden have followed a containment road in relation to China although a containment road with a, without a map, a containment road without a master plan. Um, consistency, uh, so, um, the, 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 the fundamental problem with this, uh, with this containment policy comes from the geopolitical, uh, from geopolicy. Um, is it possible to indefinitely constrain China to a secondary role in an area with the, which is of geostrategic priority to it? Um, is it possible to, 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 to contain China when China controls the, 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 the scenario with an area denial strategy? Uh, and is it possible to constrain a power which essentially wants to deter penetration in its 
own area of influence. So, geopolitically, the contained in China seems to be a much harder proposition than it was when containing uh, the Soviet Union. In sum, during the first Cold War, the US had the win on its back. All the right configuration of elements seems to support its policy. The playing field was the right one, uh, as the core on the panning element was its biggest strength, meaning uh, ideology. Uh, its support base was a large and extensive network of allies uh, to reinforce its position. Um, the consistency of purpose was clear enough as it follow a, a, a master plan, a clear master plan. The economic correlation between the parties clearly leaned on America's favor, as it inhabited the economic high ground. And the final objective was attainable, meaning containing the Soviet Union. Hence, these positive factors allow for a, a, a for success, final success. In the emergent Cold War, the opposite seems to be happening. The wind seems to be in the face of the US. Um, and America is confronting the wrong configuration of factors. The playing field does in favor it as the underpinning element, the core underpinning element is its biggest its main witness, efficiency. The support base is faltering um, as allies um, um, losing trust in America. Again, we are living in a, uh, in a situation in Europe that projects the impression that alliances are strong, but uh, I'm very, I'm very doubtful about the, the strength of this uh, new emergence of alliances. Um, the, uh, the consistency of purpose is weak as its political parties inhabit and set into different uh, planets. Uh, the economic correlation puts it in, in a flickering place as in a few years time, the U.S. will be sliding into the economic law, lowlands, and the final objective, uh, containment, uh, seems unattainable enough, at least geopolitically. On the other hand, China seems to be excel, ex seems to excel in an efficiency-oriented contest. Its international support base um, seems to be wider in terms of all the economic stakeholders that it has created around the world. Its focus and consistency of purpose are strong enough. Its economic strength will keep increasing with every passing year. And the notion of containing China doesn't seem plus. As a result, in the same manner in which the first Cold War ended up by projecting the US to the pinnacle of the international system, this second Cold War might represent uh, its dwindling and its path uh, into, into decline. It, it may trend, it may signal its transit from preeminence to decline. Uh, with uh, such an auspicious outlook, common sense would advise that the US explores alternative to Cold War with China, avoiding a zero-sum confrontation, accepting the inevitable emergence of China, and looking for whatever constructive cohabitation it may find. However, even if the US uh, would arrive to the conclusion that it should coexist 
constructively with China. It's not clear that uh, China would be ready. Uh, you need two for tango. And China might indeed be an unwilling tango partner. Uh, because it believes that it is at, uh, at the time of a big power pushover and that um, it's amid great changes not seen uh, in a century and when, and when time and momentum are on its side. So it may well be that uh, China uh, it's not ready for, for, for this kind of constructive cohabitation. Whatever the case, uh, uh, definitely uh, the US should explore this option between uh, before uh, closing uh, behind it, itself the door and not being able to find alternatives to a cold war which will become harder with every passing year. So essentially did discover the narrative of my book and uh, of course we can now enter into the question and answer period. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for summing up the narrative in the book uh, so beautifully. And uh, but um, I have a, a few questions, of course. And um, you have uh, highlighted, of course, the fault lines within US and also uh, when it comes to their foreign policy and how um, it is not the same. The alliances are not the same as it used to be. But I like to question you on the fault lines within China, because it is not that um, China doesn't have uh, issues domestically. It has quite a few issues. Uh, and also when it comes to the economy, because you have extensively written about, you know, how um, China's economy, especially uh, the way it delivers. Now, um, as far as uh, my reading goes, China has its own fault lines. First, of course, uh, Tibet has always been an issue. And uh, you must, I mean, uh, there was a recent, uh, you know, um, what to say, self immolation of a singer, Tibetan singer, that happened last month. The Uyghurs, um, you know, uh, that is another uh, fault line. And especially after 2016, that has kind of, you know, caught, uh, aggravated, and, uh, you know, even um, countries, um, around our, uh, you know, talking about it, which they were not. Then, of course, the Mongolian um, issue, because we have seen how uh, Xi Jinping's, uh, President Xi Jinping's policies have actually kind of uh, trying to uh, forcefully assimilate the ethnic minorities in China. So these are, of course, fault lines. Then, as far as the economy goes, we have seen that there has been, uh, you know, the China China's economic situation has been going downhill since 2018, and uh, of course, the trend uh, kind of accelerated uh, with the onset of the COVID pandemic. We cannot deny the fact, and we already see that 14% of unemployment is there, graduate unemployment, and it is rising. And uh, then uh, we recently uh, saw that. Um, uh, and 2019, uh, it provided an estimated 80 to 90 percent uh, that small and medium, uh, you know, entrepreneurs who, uh, you know, who were in difficulty. And uh, the recent uh, meetings that are there, the recent articles that are published are being published, especially in the Chinese language media, indicate that, you know, the economy is in trouble. Uh, of course, we have to uh, check the figures back and forth and we have to read between the lines so there are enough indicators um, that uh, a severe economic that china is facing a severe economic problem so how do you see these fault lines when uh, we talk about of course um, um, we are talking about how the the, the fault lines within us is affecting uh, uh, you know now um, it's a uh, policy. So how do you think uh, these fault lines will act when, um, especially when it comes to China's, um, uh, you know, when China dream, the way it is dreaming to be, of course, uh, the global power by 2049. How do you situate these uh, fault lines? 
Yes, definitely. Probably you failed to mention the fact that its harsh policy towards Hong Kong has alienated Taiwan and the possibility and has foreclosed the possibility of, for, of a peaceful integration with Taiwan. Uh, hence, of course, China is facing numerous problems, not only politically, but uh, economically as well. And as you mentioned, COVID is indeed a big problem. The, the closure of its main cities and uh, the virtual closure of several sectors of its economy uh, has affected substantially its uh, economic growth. And uh, China is not lacking problems, of course. I, I don't want to paint a rosy picture for China, saying that everything goes well on that side, where it, uh, all in the American sides are problem. Of course, America, on the other hand, has a very strong uh, technological industry. America has important strength, but the fact remains uh, that America, at this point in time, it's utterly divided, it's utterly fractured. The kind of fracture we are witnessing in the United States is uh, enough to, 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 to create the dwindling of a very powerful nation. We don't see the equivalent in, in China, notwithstanding all the problems it may have. Uh, on the contrary, to a certain extent, we might, uh, we, you could even say that uh, Xi Jinping's forceful uh, grab of power has uh, absorbed many of the problems that the country had before. Uh, many analysts talked uh, a few years ago about the possibility of a, a, a fracture of the Communist Party of a result of its four main um, a, a group in uh, uh, its four main uh, divisions. Uh, a few years ago, the military was compartmentalized was a compartment apart from the civilian structure. It didn't, it was reluctant to follow civil directives and so on and so forth. Now, uh, with its uh, anti-corruption campaign, Xi Jinping has placed the military forces on the, on the civilian control, and that admits no doubt. On the other hand, was a, growing the balls between China's population and the uh, Chinese Communist Party, which has been solved because with its nationalistic uh, policies, um, Xi Jinping has been able to reconnect with the uh, public sentiment. Hence, to a certain extent, even China confronts many problems in different areas. You see that there is an homogeneity uh, that it la that you don't see in the U.S. Uh, and and um, yes, China confronts uh, several problems at the same time. But on the other hand, it has proved itself to 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 be able to to handle them quite efficiently in the last few decades. Of course, there are some points that may prove too difficult to, 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 to handle. Uh, Taiwan may be one of them. If uh, Xi Jinping keeps pushing in, in the direction of uh, a forceful reunification with Taiwan, it may face a very difficult uh, situation. Economically, things are not clear, but um, nonetheless, uh, uh, nonetheless, China keeps being in a very strong position. So, uh, the problem perhaps with writing a book in these days is that uh, things are evolving so quickly that it's difficult to keep track with the evolution of events. But in general terms, I would say that the big picture that I frame in my book, it's still, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's there. Uh, this brings me to uh, the next question, because we've already, um, like, uh, 
I kind of highlighted the fault lines, of course, within China. But also, uh, when it comes to Xi Jinping's uh, foreign policy, it has been quite aggressive. We have seen that, of course, during COVID and before COVID. And being from India, of course, um, we have seen a steady decline in India-China relationship, uh, especially after 2014, that we have seen a very systematic decline. And of course, uh, the Galwan Valley incident of May 2020 also kind of, uh, you know, uh, brought uh, India and China to a stage where, uh, you know, after 15 uh, commander level talks, we are still nowhere. And it's not only India. I see that, uh, you know, at least China uh, is being, uh, you know, facing a lot of setback when it also comes to the Belt and Road Initiative. A lot of countries, including um, Vietnam, including Myanmar, including, in fact, uh, China's best friend, Pakistan, where we see a lot of projects being rolled back. And uh, BRI, the way, uh, it, in fact, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is uh, one of the only um, legs of BRI that has seen the kind of, you know, um, infrastructure development that we see uh, but the other uh, you know aspects of the belt and road initiative have seen a backlash and many countries uh, you know have been because whatever uh, Ch the loans uh, china is giving loans to these countries it is of course not aid and everybody understands that and a lot of countries are also facing the debt crisis how do you situate um, the backlash when it comes to especially the Belt and Road Initiative to China's, uh, uh, you know, the multilateral pro projects and especially the way BRI was um, envisaged and also got the push from President Xi Jinping and China uh, to be this global project that is going to be uh, to give uh, to be good, uh, which will deliver uh, all the goods to, you know, goods in the sense of, of course, infrastructure, economy and everything to the local people and that kind of backlash we are also and also we are seeing what we are seeing in pakistan we are seeing the um especially the baluch and uh, the gilgit balistan region they are also kind of opposing uh the cpec so how do you situate uh china's multilateral approach when it itself is facing a lot of setbacks when it comes to the belt and road initiative well, definitely, when you had this kind of tremendously ambitious project as the Belt and Road, and you have limited instrumental capabilities because no country is big enough to to to, to instrument appropriately, or uh, you have to have that kind of backlashes. That's unavoidable. But on the other hand, you have to see the big picture as well. The big picture being that uh, globalization is dwindling. Uh, you are seeing it the coping of uh, the global economy. You are seeing a division of spheres, of economic spheres. You are seeing uh, how both superpowers are pushing to establish their own uh, areas of penetration for the, ten, for the technologies. Uh, you are seeing how America is in, within a reshoring process in which it has to rebuild the sources of raw materials and so on and so forth. And within this context, when you see that big picture again, uh, China is acting much more systematically and much more strategically. Let's go to the other side of the fence. Uh, America and Latin America. Historically, Latin America has been the backyard of the United States. However, since the beginning of the millennium, China jumped into, into the fence that protected America's backyard and uh, have uh, acted as if it's owned it. And the fact remains that even at a point in time when both superpowers are the coping their economies and when both superpowers are trying to uh, grasp areas of economic influence, you see how the United States is doing 
practically nothing in terms of guaranteeing Latin America in face of China's challenge. Hence, you talk to me about the problems, the concrete problems that China is facing here and there, which are logical when you are trying to instrument such a huge project. But strategically, at least, you see a, a, a roadmap, you see a grand strategy, and you don't see that in the American side, not even in America's backyard. So uh, is this lack of, of a strategic uh, consistency, which, uh, which for me is a bit appalling. Thank you, sir. There are actually many, um, because we have you and, uh, you know, um, with your uh, knowledge, I, there were so many questions that I wanted to ask, but I've been indicated that we are running out of time. So one last question. Uh, because um, because we have been talking about uh, China strategies and the U.S. strategies, how um, and you um, you very consistently in your book and even here you have said that China has a plan and the U.S. doesn't. So one last question I would like to ask is how do you um, see uh, the Indo-Pacific economic framework for prosperity that has been declared recently? of course, by um, the Quad members and especially by President Biden and his remark on Taiwan when he said that they are going to defend Taiwan. How do you situate these two things in the, in the larger geopolitical situation uh, of today? It, it all, the problem is that all this depends on a frail old man and who knows if he would be able to present him, himself for re-election in, in, in a couple of years' time. And you have this distinct possibility of Donald Trump being re-elected uh, or being uh, re-elected in, 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 in two years' time. Uh, hence, it's not a consistent strategy when it all uh, falls back when it all depends in a single man who has the best intentions and who definitely goes, it's going in the right direction. But uh, you, need, you need more than that to build a strategy. You would need to have, uh, you would need to have a consensus in the United States that you do not find. On the other hand, when we talk about uh, defending uh, economically, I think that uh, this economic initiative uh, doesn't go far enough. It should, it, it should be much more ambitious than it is. And conversely, um, defending, uh, defending Taiwan, as President Biden has expressed, doesn't seem to be uh, all that realistic, even uh, because uh, it's difficult to prevail and all the Pentagon uh, uh, scenarios have proven so that in a war with China, the US may not prevail. And it's difficult to prevail when there is a distance of 7,000 miles from American shores into uh, Taiwan sh uh, shores, or there is a distance of 4,000 miles from Hawaii in, in, uh, to, 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 to Taiwan, whereas there are just 90 miles uh, separating uh, mainland China with Taiwan. And in addition to that, when uh, China has con concentrated the bulk of its armed forces in its own area, and the US has disseminated them all around the world through uh, seven commands, strategic commands, regional commands, and uh, uh, so it's, it's difficult under those conditions that uh, that the U.S. could indeed prevail in case of a conflict uh, with China. But more than that, as I mentioned before, the fact remains that all of this is on the shoulders of a frail old man. 
thank you sir thank you for taking out the time and talking to us it was wonderful having you and we look forward to having you again with us thank you sir thank you so much thank you so much thank you so much uh, ambassador indeed it was a very comprehensive and enlightening conversation and mr abhinav pandya conveyed his regards apparently he was not here he was in uh, kashmir uh, for his field research but he conveyed his regards thank you thank you so much for taking time thank you thank sir thank you so much to to you both thank you thank you so much